Why that? <laughs> Peter Gabriel, Google, Google, Peter Gabriel. <laughs> So this is another Talks at Google event for Mountain View, and we're very, very pleased to welcome musician, artist, and activist Peter Gabriel here today. Um, we are going to have a great chance to ask some questions about the current tour and the 25th anniversary of So, which is going to be released actually at the end of October, on October 22nd. And we'll also have some chance for the audience to ask some questions as well. So why don't we get started? You're here on tour. You're kind of in the middle of the tour. And what yep. was the, um, the story behind the tour? How did it come to be? Well, um, there were a number of things. I mean, I've never really done a retro tour before and uh, was pretty resistant. You know, with, um, I know Robert Plant quite well and we were so sort of chiding each other on who's going to succumb to the big money first. And, uh, <laughs> um, and uh, anyway, I went to see the Beach Boys do Pet Sounds, which I always used to love. And Matt convinced me that to see uh, one of the records that you enjoy from start to finish was, was actually a good thing. And that coincided with some nice offers, so that was um, uh, an easy decision. And it was, uh, I'm actually going to take a sabbatical year this year with my family. We've got a teacher coming out with us, and uh, so it helps underwrite that sabbatical year as well. So there were a number of reasons, but um, I decided to bring back the band that originally toured that record and so that's been fun um, and we're actually having a great time we do the we do the evening in three parts so the first part is based on the idea that the process is often as interesting if not more interesting than the final product so we start off with an unfinished song and then we do sort of rehearsal mode with the house lights on that's the starter then the main course is uh, a few songs, more electronic um, or electric versions of things, and then uh, the last chunk, you know, if you can get through all that, you get your dessert, which is the So album. So that's how it works. And specifically about the So album, so you're playing, the, the actual uh, tour is called Back to Front, and mm. it seems to be some of the format you just discussed, but the playing So, the track order that you have now, that wasn't the original track order, correct? Well, this is an interesting uh, diversion about technology because uh, although I'm a you know, big fan of vinyl, I was also a great fan of, of the digital world because suddenly we could get more dynamics in the music and there were restrictions in the vinyl world. For example, the track In Your Eyes, I always wanted to go at the end of the record, um, but it has a good bass line there. To get a fat bass line on a full vinyl record, you can't put it near the end. You have to have it near near the beginning, so it went on the start of side two, um, just because the, there wasn't enough room for the needle to vibrate um, as it got close to the center. So then, when CDs came along, I was able to take that track and put it back on the end where it always should have been. And on this release that's coming up, it's not just, there's, so there's a, a couple of variations, as, as I understand. There's the CD itself, so yeah. you're re-releasing, you've remastered that, and that's yeah. the third time you've remastered that. Yeah, well, as long as people, people keep buying it, we'll remaster it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then there's actually going to be a, a comprehensive box set that's got it's, it, both CDs, and some material that hasn't been released yet, and also a DVD with um, some concert footage. Yeah. And have you been just... Sitting on this, this has been in the stores. Yeah, we'll throw any old shit in there, you know. <laughs> hey, it was old. Get it in. No, but this, uh, there were a couple of things that, uh, yeah, we were waiting for the right day, and the right day, you know, I'd, you always get more interested in the latest things, so we'd sort of forgotten about. But also, we shot the film, uh, filmed the um, the show uh, 25, 26 years ago, and. Um, uh, Scorsese had been producing and he, he'd got this wonderful um, cinematographer doing it and we hadn't realized uh, quite what we had so we went back to the film so I mean uh, tons of film cans that had to be uh, carefully resurrected and then we'd, we took the um, all the data of of the film and and have a much better resolution um, 
version of that concert than we had done previously. And the actual production of, of so, and then also some of the videos and, and the document documenting that, how, over what time period did that actually happen from kind of when you thought about the album, conceived it originally to actually getting it out the door? Sorry, this latest thing or the original? The original one. Um, I think that just sort of happened uh, as, as things came up. Uh, um, there wasn't really a, a brilliant master plan. It was, you know, when we finish this, then what else do we need to do? Um, so, uh, and we, we try and film things. I mean, again, if you have the opportunity to have two gigs in the same place, then it makes filming a lot easier because you can do the setup. Uh, and all the mistakes you make on the first day, you can try and sort out on the second day. But, um, and we did that in, in Greece as well. So when you're approaching songwriting, or maybe at the time when you were approaching songwriting with regards to so, did you have a, a list of songs and then say, okay, right, I'm going to select these musicians to start working with, or were you writing and recording at the same time? Um, I'm always writing lyrics uh, until the day it's um, released, really. <laughs> but uh, I'm slow with those. But, but the, yeah, there was a few ideas. In fact, I'd forgotten this, but M Manu and Tony said that uh, Sledgehammer was an afterthought. The, the, um, they, there was a taxi waiting to take uh, Manu back to Paris, and we had an hour left. And I, th I think I said, I've got this new idea that maybe we could just put sa a demo down on, and, and that was it. Uh, I mean, we carried on working on it because it felt great, um, but uh, it was quite an afterthought. And then Sledgehammer also took on a life of its own when it came to the video, which you worked with Ardman on and others. Um, and yeah. my son first, you know, straight away, he's like, the chickens, that looks just like Walsh and Gromit. Yeah. Um, how, did that, how did that come to be? Well, actually, um, it was, the, yeah, the, the man who did the chickens was the man who created Wallace and Gromit. Um, and uh, they, uh, I was working with this brilliant uh, director, Stephen R. Johnson, um, <clears throat> and he brought in the Quay Brothers, who are fantastic, um, sort of dark East European looking animation. And I saw they've now got a big thing at MoMA in New York. Um, and I brought in Ardman Animation, who were from down the road in, in Bristol. Uh, Stephen and I had a couple of weeks just bashing through ideas, and then we brought in the others. And it was a really uh, exciting, creative brainstorming. And that's, I mean, that's always been one of the things I most enjoy about what I do is, you know, working with people uh, from different backgrounds, often smarter than I am, and just cooking something up. So it's, um, it was a great experience, but quite painful too because we did everything in the old-fashioned way frame by frame so when you see a sky moving across my face that is being painted frame by frame and the skin gets very raw and when you <laughs> when you're under glass uh, with a lot of raw fish on day one that's fine but day two it's <laughs> uh, yeah at least you you put the blame on the fish and that video, I think, is actually the most played video ever on MTV. I mean, granted, they don't play quite as many videos these days, but still, the fact that... Um, <laughs> Do they that, play that, any? That's a, yeah. That's, a, yeah. that's a huge you know, accomplishment, and I think that it also, I mean, having been you know, relatively young at that age, it was so d different than most ever, anything that was out there. And, um, and it really kind of set a standard for also an immersive, or just a, an experience that was getting you into... Um, the, the mind of the, the writer and the artist in a, in a different way, I think, of seeing kind of um, an entertainment value that wasn't just for the sake of entertainment, but also telling a story. Yeah, I think it, it I mean, what was great about videos then is that there were people that wanted to watch them, and there was a budget, and there were no rules, you know, so you could do what the hell you wanted, and there was no one there to say, no, this is the way we do it. And when you, when you approach, um, kind of back to songwriting, I want to just ask, what do you, I know that I think Mike Rutherford maybe made the comment once that you're a frustrated drummer or, or yeah. uh, over time. And you started as a drummer yeah. in, in uh, school. Do you, do you think you think more rhythmically originally about a song or do you think more melodically? I think both. I mean, there are some things which are just based on melody, but groove is what you know, drove me into music. I, I thought drummers, they seem to you know, be in command of this really loud thing. 
and uh, it looks like a lot of fun, and that's what I wanted to be. I was very enthusiastic, not very good, but uh, and it was fine in the early days of Genesis because we had guys uh, who weren't, they were good, solid drummers, but they weren't that creative, and then when we got Phil, unfortunately, he was a way better drummer than than I was, but I used to still have some bits of my drum kit on stage, and and I would find my uh, bass drum full of carpet, and uh, you know, and, and gradually, you know, these things were getting reduced. So there were um, there was a subtle way of saying, <laughs> saying that maybe I wasn't the best timekeeper. However, I worked also. I mean, you know, being a major drum fan, I've worked with some of the best drummers in the world, I think. Um, and one of those uh, is Stuart Copeland, who is also a lousy timekeeper. And <laughs> but he's, Just don't tell that to Stuart Copeland. No, I've told him. He's, he'll say it himself, because he races. But, but it, the energy he puts into his drumming and the attack on it is fantastic, and, uh, and he does that brilliantly. And on the album, he played hi-hat. On. Well, this is the thing. I had so many wonderful drummers I could, you know, cut up bits and pieces and yeah, get a bit of a hi hat from Stuart, a kick from Manu, and I mean, it, whatever it was, it was just. Um, uh, but I'm a bit obsessive, as you you might guess from this, that you know the groove has to be right, and uh, and I think you know we work quite hard trying to find grooves that aren't the regular ones you're hearing on the radio. And I think with having a, this band back on stage together, is there some kind of moments where you look around and it's deja vu? It's Yeah. Um, you know, and we all look exactly the same as we did 25 <laughs> years ago. Uh, but, well, actually, a couple of the guys do. I, I, I wish I could say that. But uh, it's, um, it's a bit like family get-togethers, because, you know, you end up with the same bunch of folk doing exactly the same things you always did uh, with all the pleasures and problems that went along the first time. <laughs> so um, it feels very familiar, but uh, I'm enjoying it a lot. And as far as the way in which the songs evolve when you're on tour, do you try out kind of, there's that section that's defined as, let's play with these more, but do you also come back and rearrange the songs a little bit by the end? Are they the same songs that you start out at the beginning of the tour when you wind up at the end? Well, we try and get them right, you know, that's, <laughs> so uh, we are, I mean, we're tweaking, you know, every sound check, we're trying to find a few of the weaknesses and nail them. And, and we never used to play all the tracks together, partly because you know, two of them were a bitch to get right, and uh, we couldn't get them working. So I, th I think we're, we're closing in on them anyway. Um, but yeah, you do want to keep changing it. However. Uh, I keep forgetting because we did start off rehearsing some other stuff as well. But now it's it's um, once we've got things beginning to feel like a real show and uh, uh, working properly, then when you do change the numbers over, then it means also you've got to reprogram the lights and and all that stuff. So uh, I think we will be doing that, and getting some flexibility, but um, gently. And in a tour like this, I know that. You've always put a lot of energy and, and time to make a concert just a full experience, not just, okay, you know, here's some nice lights and, and here are the songs, and hopefully played the best they can be, but also the, um, the experience of the songs in a way. How much time does it go into actually prepping for a tour like this? Well, there's a fair bit. I mean, I've got some very smart people, and in fact, there was an idea originally 25, 26 years ago when I was just doing videos and I saw the cameras on these booms that were um, being manually operated and I thought the, the way they moved was really cool. So we replaced the cameras with lights and now we've got lights with little cameras on them as well. But they're still manually operated and it, um, I'm working on another show after this which will be more robotic I think. But but this one, I'm really enjoying the sort of manual element, which is, I think, uh, it feels quite futuristic and retro simultaneously. And speaking of robots, you've always been, I guess what in Silicon Valley speak would be an early adopter of technology and, and release of CD-ROMs and 
even using, you know, back to drums, the first kind of gated or largely used gated drum sounds and things like that. If you just always had a fascination with technology, or how do you kind of use it to, to stimulate yeah. creativity? Well, my dad was an inventor, electrical engineer, and designed with an Italian a system. Um, uh, it was a <clears throat> TV system called Dialer Program, but it was, in a way, uh, it was home shopping, electronic democracy, entertainment on demand, but it was 1971 and accessed through the rotary dial of the telephone. Uh, so um, he, I think, yeah, then tried to sell it, and it was a little too early. Um, <laughs> But, uh, but I, you know, I saw him passionate about what technology could do for people. And uh, so I think that, uh, although I don't have his skills, I have his enthusiasm. So I still love to get involved with uh, all sorts of techie things. And I think I'll open up for questions in a sec if people want to line up. Um, but around selecting musicians, because you have worked with so many, what's What's the process by, whereby you kind of discover or like to collaborate? Because it's spoiled for choice. You could kind of bring in all these different folks as you develop new music or go back to visit old ones. Is it it's probably it's, tough to select? Yeah, it's difficult. To, I mean, I think I like to have a core of family around me because there's a shorthand. It's just more efficient. Uh, and uh, if you want to get ideas and people know um, what it is you like and what works and what doesn't work, uh, I think it, it's it's speed. I think the the great giants of the creative process that are hardly ever acknowledged, uh, which I'm sure applies in your world, are boredom and fatigue, and they hover over everything. Uh, and as soon as you get tired or bored, you know the thing is dead. So it's trying to keep things sparkly and uh, crackling long enough to support life on their own, um, and that's, I think, best achieved in my case with some home team and some new, exciting, inspiring guests. So as far as keeping um, or becoming more efficient and, create, yeah. and creative, do you think you've managed that over time? Um, I'm not sure. I'm still, uh, I'm still terrible getting lyrics finished. You know, I, I feel I can come up with some musical ideas I'm happy with fairly quickly and but lyrics, uh, I have to go off, isolate myself from my family, and I have a theory, which probably a lot of smart people here, someone could tell me if there's any substance in it, but peripheral visual stimulation. In other words, if I get on a train, and I know a lot of other creative folk who get a lot more ideas on the train than they do sitting at a desk. And I think that when you're in a train or in a car, you've got stuff coming past you. And in the old days when we were either chasing or being chased, and there were a lot of important things dependent on it, like whether we survive to tomorrow, um, the body had some mechanism for accelerating and pumping adrenaline around when you get this peripheral visual acceleration or speed. Um, so. That's what I do when I get stuck. I get on a train. And, and I've suggested that to quite a few other folk who've uh, had some success with it. So anyway, that's my offering for today. <laughs> uh, and uh, we do have a sponsorship from a train company. <laughs> the Caltrain's about to get a lot busier. Um. Uh, can you hear me? Oh, there we yeah. Go. So I was lucky enough to see your tour in 1986 when you did this album the first time. Greatest tour of my ever life. Oh, or thank you. Show of my life I've ever seen. Sorry, I'm a little nervous. Uh, and I was really excited when you mentioned the lights on the jib arm. Yeah. That's like a, a visual memory that stuck with me since then. Great. Well, we don't have, I mean, we have one or two overhead lights, but the normal sort of proscenium arch and so on, uh, we've thrown away. So I wanted to ask a couple of quick questions about other things you might have considered bringing back. Yeah. To you know, use again. The first, and I'm probably going to say his name wrong, but uh, when I saw you, you had the opening act was Yusin Ador. Oh, right. Sang on In Your Eyes. And he, that, of course, came out and sang with you. Were you able to get him to come out and tour with you this time? Uh, sadly, he was. They actually created a new law in Senegal to stop him becoming president. And he's now Minister of Culture uh, because he's, he's like 
God out there. And um, but so he's not really doing much music at the moment. Um, besides which, he's a you know great and celebrated artist in his own right now. So um, the idea of back up on my tour, I'm sure. <laughs> but but you know. He's godfather to my son, and I am to one of his, so we're still very good friends. But um, I, he's an amazing artist. Yeah. And the other is um, a little bit more on the technology side. Yeah. Uh, recreating the sounds. Yeah. Uh, like, for example, did you have to dig out your old Fairlight, and did the floppy disk still work? Or, I mean, how do you, how do, you yeah. do that to recreate all those old sounds? I think actually archiving, um, yeah, your history is your future. Because we were talking to some of the Pixar folk, and they were saying that they couldn't play back some of the files from the original Toy Story. And it's a real issue, I think, that there's sort of some consciousness of how we can hold stuff. And, you know, and I think they're taking um, digital stuff and putting it on film. Uh, so it's, it's all back to front. And, and I, I mean, maybe some people here have solved this, but I think it's a, an issue that needs some um, careful thought. Uh, we did take some of the sounds, but um, yeah, the, some of the floppies weren't working, and uh, uh, and we had trouble looking for DAT players. And um, but uh, yeah, there were one or two people who've been smart enough to to try and hold on to bits of historical technology and try and keep it working, um, so that desperate people like myself can uh, be rescued. Thank you. Hello, Mr. Gabriel. Uh, I'm a lifelong fan, and uh, I Great. hope you never stop making music, and I hope you, you always sing Wallflower in every concert you oh, do. Oh, thank and, you. Uh, um, I'm not I, playing it tonight, but... Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Had to try. Um, my question is a little bit weird. Um, in Salisbury Hill, the last verse is very, you know, you saying you want, you're going to go home, and that, that kind of closes the story nicely and wraps up the song. Um, Sorry, which... Salisbury. Salisbury, right, yeah. And so I'm wondering, I'm curious why when you sing it live sometimes, oftentimes I've heard you sing it, and the last verse, you tend to sing the original first part of the verse. Um, the, you know, um, I'm just so nervous, I'm going to forget it. Okay. But, but uh, I'm just wondering if it's... Yeah, if it's is this I screw up the lyrics? Cause, okay. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> why, why do you screw up the last verse of Salisbury Hill? <laughs> okay. Um... If it's because I screw up lyrics on a regular basis. <laughs> and, and I used to just read the, the lips of the front row. <laughs> <laughs> Which was fine when they learned the English version. And, uh, and now, of course, we have prompting screens, which are um, for, for those senior moments. Okay, well, that was it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Of course, you've got to be able to read them. <laughs> Hi, Peter. Uh, I'm a huge Lifetime fan. Great. All throughout my uh, college days, I had a huge poster of you on my wall. <laughs> so, we were just good friends. Really. <laughs> <laughs> so it's nice to see, see you live. Um, I also attended the 86 concert, and it was the best concert of my life also. Oh. And I remember you uh, walking in that circular wheel. And, the hamster uh, cage. <laughs> yeah. Just wondering if there was going to be any more... Uh, things like that at today's concert? It's pretty simple, and it's, it's just really the, these old lights on the booms. Um, yeah, we, this one was more about the, the music and less about the production. The next one I'm planning is the other way around, um, but right now, that's the focus. And the other question I had was, um, a while back, uh, Salman Ahmed from Janoon, he was here at Google, and he mentioned oh, yeah. that you were going to be doing a recording together and doing some maybe some concerts, is that in the plans? Uh, I, he sent me some stuff which I'm still hoping that we can work on with some uh, Kuali things, because th he was doing a fantastic job singing um, with, uh, uh, with some of the Kuali stuff. And uh, so I'm, I'm still hoping something will happen with that. We, we're, with our record company, because of the sort of collapse of the record business you know we have to get a sign in from various partners before we can proceed and and we haven't had that as yet but i'm still hoping we may be able to get something going there he's an interesting musician and yeah. and the last question i have is uh will you be doing any more world music concerts and 
happening on? With yeah, we still, we have a world music festival, WOMAD, and um, that has just had its 30th anniversary. Uh, and we had, um, it's done well in, I mean, we've had in 80 countries now, and uh, we'd like to try bring it back um, over here. Um, we were in, uh, I forget, I think 92 Golden Gate Parkway, and then we had um, a sort of future zone area, which was a techie thing, you know, because uh, I'm still in love with the idea of sort of science and technology and handmade and traditional culture. Uh, and, and I hope we'll be able to um, reintroduce that part of it into the WOMAD Festival, but um, it's still something that we're we're trying to um, evolve. And just wanted to let you know that one of my favorite songs from you that puts shudders through me is uh, that song called Biko. All right, yeah. Well, we, we'll be finishing tonight with it. Oh. Yeah. Mr. Gabriel, it's an honor to have you here. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, we wondered, you know, today that cell phones and cameras are everywhere. Yeah. Um, we wondered if there has been any follow-up on the Witness project? Uh, yeah. Well, it's, and I think we've had some help um, from Google.org and also with the YouTube folk on getting a human rights channel. Because before, the problem was, that, I mean, we tried to do our own sort of human rights destination thing called the hub. And the, the problem was that, yeah, we, it was doing its job well, which was basically to provide more security, anonymity, and context around any um, bit of video. But um, we didn't have the eyeballs. And so YouTube clearly has lots of eyeballs. So uh, along with Storyful, we're, we're now working on, on that. And uh, um, I'm just, I think we're just beginning to see the transformation that the mobile phone is going to have in our world. and and it's. And it's absolutely huge. I'm really excited that, you know, anything, I mean, you see what's happening in the Middle East or any area of protest that the young people protesting don't feel isolated in a way that they did before. National sovereignty borders were very effective in the past in, in uh, whenever those in power wanted to shut down protest. And it doesn't work in the same way. I mean, Clearly, technology can be used for good or for bad, and it's a cat and mouse game. Uh, and at the same time, um, in providing uh, yeah, for activism, for healthcare, for education. Uh, and I mean, I got suckered into a thing with we have this elders project, which is former statesmen. Um, in fact, if I, I just lay out the pitch because the way I see it, if you have anything bad going on in the world, uh, and then you can map it in the way that Ushahidi has done, for instance, um, that it will never be forgotten. And then you can go and sort of zoom into that and hear personal stories in the voices of those affected, so, so it's not being interpreted by the outside, but they're telling their own stories. Uh, and that's where you know YouTube Witness and various others, um, Global Voices, it, it, uh, all come in. Then you have sort of campaign building, and Avars, I think, are probably the most effective at, at that. You know, if they're 15 million now, they could be 150 million, or numbers that politicians can no longer ignore. Uh, and then the elders, where you can have high level interventions, so you go straight to parliament or presidents or whoever it is, uh, but connected to, to what's happening on the ground. Then you start to see this whole other. Uh, infrastructure forming that um, is based around the mobile phone uh, that I really think can transform the world. Um, and just from the healthcare side, you know, we, we're seeing um, some of these, like the Tricorder Prize, where I think 20 parameters, um, the Tricorder, for those who didn't watch Star Trek, was <laughs> the device that you could wave over someone, it would give you everything that was good and bad about what was going on in their body. And uh, we are going to be completely unable to provide high-tech health care for the world, except through the mobile. And, and there are all these wonderful things coming along. Whereas a, a scanner, I think the Tricorder Prize is going to go you know, within the next 18 months, two years. And that 
you know, can read these parameters better. I mean, we have things that, you know, already, uh, I saw this um, scanner that went into the blood, looked at the car carotenoids, gave you a reading, so it could tell you, you know, two donuts in, you, you know, three days of healthy eating and you're back up to your level. But, but suddenly you then got competitive um, feedback and group sort of psychology and keeping us well. And uh, anyway, I, I go on for a long time on this stuff because I'm so excited by it. And, uh, and I know all of you guys are working on this, these things. And, uh, uh, and I think it's completely up to us whether it's used positively or negatively. Uh, while, I'm on, <laughs> while I'm on one, um, data, I think, is going to be a huge area, and uh, I know this is potentially contentious, but I think we have or should have legal right to own or co-own any data that we generate in a digital world, and uh, um, that's something that I hope the elders will be campaigning for, um, along with the, uh, a lot of other people, you know, because clearly that has real commercial value. But um, when we are allowed to touch and own or co-own that, um, I think there will be a sort of self-regulating mechanism which is fundamental to the evolution of the digital world. And the elders, just for context, is Sorry. a group of senior leaders um, <coughs> and luminaries, Jimmy Carter, Desmond Tutu. Kofi Annan, Mary Robinson, Ella Bhatt. I mean, they're extraordinary people. And it was the idea of just trying to get a a group of, um, it's 10 of them at the moment, but the idea should be 12. We got Mandela to found it originally, and, and they can make interventions. But I think our dream is, or my dream, uh, I think some of the elders' dream too, is that when that link can be connected to these movements that, that grow up from the ground, that can give voice to the voiceless, etc., that it can be part of a, of a new mechanism for, for uh, balancing. And uh, I have a Sorry, yeah, you didn't expect all that shit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I have a message from a very good dear friend of mine who uh, actually introduced me to your music that he misses the transparent balls and feathers. And <laughs> feathers? I, I don't remember the feathers. <laughs> but uh, the transparent balls, well, I, w I won't take my trousers off now. <laughs> Hello, Mr. Gabriel. Hi. This is the coolest thing ever, incidentally. Oh, talking thank to you. Like this. Thank you. Uh, me and my friends went to your 86 concert. We're all going again tonight. Great. It'll be a lot of fun. You talked earlier about uh, revisiting old stuff. Any chance we'll hear from Rayel again? Well, someone, uh, there was an illustrator I met in Chicago who's sort of working on some, and the, uh, one or two people um, ask about film stuff, and I think if if some serious steam got underway uh, with Lamb as a film project, then I think that might um, sort of regurgitate <laughs> some of the rest of it. Because you have to know that that was totally groundbreaking. It's one of my favorite pieces of music of thank all you. time. Thank you very much. Thank you for doing this. Okay, you're welcome. I'm a big fan of great music, Thanks. and uh, <laughs> uh, particularly going back to Genesis, uh, Selling England by the Pound, one of my favorite albums of all time. Um, my question, uh, many, many years ago, I guess maybe around the time of so, uh, I had a friend who was uh, writing music and he uh, uh, was a big fan of yours as well and uh, he, he was all, oh, Peter Gabriel's playing in town, uh, I think I'm going to go to the concert, see if I can catch him afterwards and shoot him a tape and uh, maybe he'll uh, hear it and, uh, and really like it, maybe, uh, maybe we'll work together and, uh, you know. <laughs> And I'm all, uh, yeah, I'm not sure that's going to happen, but, uh, but I, uh, we'll take the tape right now. I, I, I wondered if, yeah, yeah, I wondered if, did you get the tape? And, uh, and uh, it, if, if so, what did you think of it? Uh, <laughs> no, well, seriously, seriously though, I mean, you, uh, well, the entire So album was actually a rip off of that tape. <laughs> But it's always made me very curious. You must get inundated with this kind of stuff, and I'm curious uh, how much you get, what what you do with it, uh, how you deal with it, and if anything interesting has ever come out of uh, these these kind of things. Um, yeah, we still do get a lot of stuff. I'm 
I used to worry a lot about it, and I'm afraid I don't so much now. You know, uh, and there's there's a lot more than we could ever listen to. So it tends we've got our record company too, so they do some listening, and we have. I think uh, Hukwe Zawasi was uh, who's uh, sadly passed, but he's amazing singer. I think that fell through the letterbox at one point. Um, so some things have just come in out of the blue, but it's it's more often through personal contact. And I have to confess, Jerry Murata, who yeah. played on so uh, drums as well, I met once, I used to play in a band, I was a kind of a drummer, more of a controlled flailer, huh. but um, yeah. actually gave him a tape. Oh, you did. So I'd also like to have some credit. <laughs> right, okay. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Hi. Uh, unfortunately, I wasn't alive for the '86 show, but I'm. Good. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> that, <laughs> I was going to say. We won't hold that uh, against you. I was going to say that makes two of us. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, uh, I really enjoy Real World uh, Records and Great. the next contest you did, and your studio is obviously amazing. I'm just curious what advice you'd give to young producers and mixing engineers who are trying to make it in today's world where um, it seems like credits aren't really a thing in the digital world. Like you download an MP3 and you can't look at a liner note, right? So right. how do you feel about that? And are you behind like the Grammy um, petition that's currently going on to get these music services to include liner notes, et cetera? Um, I didn't actually know about it, but I think I would be because I, th I think people work their asses off sometimes and they, there should be a way that you can you know, drill down and find out everything about anything. Uh, so I would support that. <clears throat> cool. Thanks. Peter, thanks for coming to Google. Um, You're welcome. Uh, listen, um, you discovered a lot of raw talent, music talent, like Nusrat um, from from uh, Subcontinent. I wanted to know how you got to discover all this thing, and are you doing any other projects with any of the subcontinent uh, singers or musicians? Uh, well, I would never call Nusrat Roar. He was a master, um, certainly when we met him. And uh, for those of you who don't know him, he's like a sort of Pavarotti from Pakistan, uh, but in Kowali. And it was actually Pete Townsend from The Who that told me about Kowali. I didn't really know much about it when we were in 1980 trying to put uh, WOMAD, this world music festival together. Um, he said you should check that out. And um, the first group we had in was was a group called Sabri Brothers. Uh, and they they were great, but they um, introduced us to others. You know, and uh, Nusrat was, you know, the most revered. Um, and we we put him with Massive Attack. Um, there's one little byline here, but we had a thing where um, we deliberately excluded the artist's own country or geographical region from our record contract, because very often artists would survive selling their records you know, with their own cassette tapes. Um, when Massive Attack did Must Must with Nusrat, I think it was the biggest single in India and no, the subcontinent, and of course we didn't benefit from that at all, which <laughs> did make us think, um, scratch our heads. But he was uh, such an amazing artist to work with. I think you know, probably the finest singer I've ever worked with. Um, in that he not only had this passionate voice, but he could improvise um, in a you know it's like composition on the spot um, of in an extraordinary, uh, powerful way. Um, so, yeah, we we still, with WOMAD, we have uh, a lot of artists from the subcontinent, and I think um, we'll still continue doing that. I'm not sure um, what there is right now. I think we've got time for one more question. I, I'm happy to do two, as okay. I've got two. <laughs> All right, uh, I guess my, uh, my anecdote of super fanhood is my LPs in my bag here that I retain two of which are both your works. Every other one I've gotten rid of. <laughs> and I've had them for since I was a kid. I was at your 86 show. And uh, I'm here to express my gratitude for your grace and humanity with how you've used your celebrity status over the years and for the decades of 
positive kind of introspection that your poetry has helped me with. So thank you for being here. Yeah. Thank you. It seems like after that question, uh, we should probably just close it. But since I'm here and you've been so gracious, I was wondering if you could uh, talk about it in your eyes and yeah. what the song means and, and writing. It's one of my favorite songs, but I'd like to hear more about it. Well, um, I guess it was a love song, but what I was interested in too was I, I had a place in Senegal for a while and I was fascinated that in Africa you could have love songs that were um, could be interpreted two ways. So it could be human physical love or it could be spiritual love for God. And, you know, in my world, um, the church thing and the, the physical romantic thing were, were miles apart. So that was a starting point for trying to sort of integrate some of the, the lyrical ideas. And, um, uh, and then I think uh, it was immortalized when John Cusack <laughs> held up the boombox, which was uh, later, I think, repeated um, uh, with Shock the Monkey playing in, on, um, uh, no, here's, I'm going to, South Park, thank you. <laughs> See, so if I can travel as a group, then we can share bits of my memory. <laughs> <laughs> well, great, um, thank, thank you very much. But, yeah, well, so, no, and I was going to talk about Yusu, too, because I think, you know, he's this sort of divine intervention at the end, because um, his voice... Uh, is uh, just straight out of heaven. So really then it's about both. It's about love of a person and yeah. of God. Or yeah, I think it's just, yeah, just outpouring of love. Neat. Well, thank you. Thanks a lot for coming. Sure, thank you. And I guess the final question is, you're going to be taking, at the end of the concert uh, tour, a, a year, and then do you have anything that you can reveal as far as plans beyond that? Or what's um, well, there's... There's still there's quite a lot of stuff sort of in the writing can, and um, there are a few projects that I think I'll get back to work in September. Um, so uh, I guess we'll know um, more then. We're trying to get a um, there's a thing called Gabble, which um, is sort of like a visual. We're trying to do a visual language for the net where it, where it turns words into pictures and. Um, We've, we're just um, starting with that, and uh, and I'm sure I'll be hustling for help later on. So don't don't worry. <laughs> a wonderful show tonight. Have great. a great rest of the tour and a great sabbatical. And thanks so much for coming by Google. Thanks. Great. <laughs>